Well, thanks for showing up so early. It's what? Is it nine? Yeah. Excellent. In that case, this is actually pretty impressive. So I want to start with a little bit of a different goal. A lot of yesterday, at least to me, was more of a technical run through. And there are elements of this that are technical. I mean, I have code samples. We'll go as deep as we want to. But my real goal here is a little different. Uh, I want to spark some idea you might have. If you've got something noodling in the back of your head, and, and Chris hit on this yesterday, last night, if you've got something that you want to pull off that just seems like it's worth your time of tinkering, I want to get it to the point where if it involves telephones, you're ready to go. It doesn't feel like there's any real barrier to being able to build Ruby and, and voice applications. Uh, second, I want to shine a light in areas that might not have been explored before. We've all heard of adhesion, or at least a lot of people have. Um, but the number of people who have actually sat down, installed adhesion, installed asterisk, gotten a PBX connection, gotten a SIP connection, and then built something, let alone actually rolled it out into production with real people calling it, pretty darn small. So I'm hoping we can kind of get a glimpse at what it looks like to have a real application in production, which I do, and we'll, we'll load it and we'll refresh and we'll call into it uh, and watch it crash. Hopefully not. <laughs> and then third, I want to help you build something cool. And the coldest thing I could think of was Zed Shaw in an igloo. <laughs> and indeed, he does look rather chilly. I don't know. It's him versus the parka. So here's where we stand today. Um, if anybody came to Ruby Hoedown last year, you might have seen Jay Phillips actually presenting about adhesion. I did not, but I've seen the slides. I've seen kind of the, the result. In the year, it doesn't feel like we've really come a year. It feels like the projects move forward a little bit. It feels like it's still a great framework. And it feels like we've solved the framework problem. We've got ways to build voice applications in Ruby. But among the crowd, has anybody actually done that? One, two. OK, so we're two for like 50 or 60. I want to raise the number, because when you're doing it, and when you actually hit an URL, or you run a rake task, or uh, bring up Merb or Sinatra, and your phone calls you, it's really freaking slick. It's like, it, like, I get a caller ID on this thing that says CloudVox or says SendSign or one of the other applications we have, and it just makes me smile. It's my version of the App Store. Um, <laughs> and I don't have to pay Apple. So the other thing I want to do is a lot of the things you might have heard about with adhesion and, and just asterisk in general is kind of hackery, and I love hackery, it's great, but I think Chris really hit, it, hit the nose, or hit the nail on the head yesterday when he said, solve a problem that you have, and there'll be other people who have that same problem, you'll have a user base ready to go, so don't try to imagine it, um, but make sure you actually have that problem. So the examples that, that come to mind, um, if you know of the, the Roomba that's callable, the Roomba vacuum, it's novel, but it's not really a problem. Um, same thing with the flower waterer. There's a way to, to make a flower waterer call you to remind you to water the plant. And again, OK, it's novel. You've proven that you can make phone calls with software. But you didn't really start out with a spark of, I've got an issue that I want to solve with phones. So the chances of that getting either usage or adoption or uh, interest or focus, any kind of cost, emphasis, whatever, is zero. Um, and that's where. We aren't going to, you know, we aren't going to feed starving kids in India, but we are going to solve some real problems here. This is 10 years in, so uh, this gentleman over here actually wrote asterisk back in the day. In fact, the day being last night, I think. <laughs> uh, this is Mark Spencer, if anybody cares. Um, he rocks, and he's he's the 10 years that asterisk has been evolving. Yeah, say hi, everybody. He's he doesn't bite. Yay! So I bring that up because where we sit at the very top of this stack, you know, you might write one line of adhesion, and that one line of adhesion might map to two or three or five or even ten AGI commands, which is the asterisk gateway interface that we'll get to here in a minute. And that might in turn map to 50 or 100 or many, many, many more macros, dial plans, um, SIP packets, of course. We're, this really is the very, very top of the stack. And we're finally at the point 
where you can sit down and without knowing a whole lot about the voice world and without knowing a whole lot about telephony at all, you can write something useful. And that's what I hope to show today. So Twitter Vox. Okay, I just said it was going to be useful. Now this. What the heck? So <laughs> if anybody pays attention to NASA at all, like, you know, we are in Hunts Vegas. There we go. So they've got a little rocket, apparently. Yeah. And they launched the lunar lander. This is the Mars Phoenix lander with a payphone and Alexander Graham Bell's creation. It's really in a studio. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. I, I actually had to borrow this from NASA to pull this shot off. It's not Photoshopped at all. <laughs> it is early, isn't it? So what this is, well, and actually a little context is in order. When it was landing, um, NASA figured as a good PR move, they would put up a, a Twitter feed because, hey, who doesn't have a Twitter feed right now? Who doesn't follow Twitter? I, I assume NASA has engineers just like us. We're all reloading all the time or reading via RSS or Twitterific or whatever. So they had the bright idea of, of Twittering in the first person as if the lunar lander was Twittering, which, hey, great PR move. Whole world is linking to it. Now they can justify more congressional budget dollars. Uh, justifiably. So what we wanted was to be able to call in and see when it landed. I wanted to hear the latest Twitter from the lunar lander over the phone. Now, I wouldn't say this is necessarily terribly utilitarian, not going to solve world hunger here, but you can imagine that if this was made public and if this was put up on the Lunar Lander blog or up on NASA or anywhere, it would have a torrent of calls, much more so than, say, the Roomba or the Flower Waterer. They're things that, that really do spread virally. So let's do it. Let me go to the App Store. Oh, wait, no, no. And you can see I have succumbed to Steve Jobs' vision. I sold my soul to the man. So I am going to call. And actually, if anybody else wants to, by all means, feel free to pull out your phone and, and give it a shot. Uh, this is running on CloudVox for the infrastructure, but the actual server that's doing the Twitter is, is sort of closer to home. It's a slice on SliceHost, so we may make it crumble, but that's okay. That's what SliceHost is there for. Um, what it's doing, and I'll get to this in a sec. Let me see if we can actually call in. Put it on speaker here. Please enter the number you wish to call. Keypad, one, two, four, five, five. There's been a new tweet. Here's what it says. Number 080808, it's all 73 here. Sol equals Martian day. Toss all I'm digging to widen the new Neverland trench. Plus, looking at some icy spots. Cheers. Goodbye. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. The Lunar Lander has told us cheers. So what did we learn from that? One, it sounds like crap. <laughs> Why does it sound like crap? Well, because we're taking total garbage a Twitter that has its own vocabulary, its own vernacular, shorthand, everything, and we're trying to run it through the most programmatic transformation you could possibly imagine, a text-to-speech engine, and expecting good output. And it really does boil down to garbage in, garbage out. Um, I'll show another example here in a minute where we speak English, and when we pass English in, lo and behold, it actually sounds pretty darn good. So while I wouldn't recommend using it for uh, free-form text, and actually, if you get a chance, load the Lunar Lander, uh, the Twitter feed. It's just twitter.com slash Mars Phoenix. What text-to-speech engine was it using? This was Kepstrel, Swift. Yeah, which... Uh, well, we have a new Allison voice, and it sounds better than that. Ooh, so a Allison's getting sexier. So these voices have names for anybody who doesn't have text-to-speech experience, which makes it more fun to say, Allison is sexy. Yeah. So th that voice was Callie, I think. Um, now, what, what happened when I placed that call? This whole stack came into play. This is the part that is actually interesting to us. So, and actually, I will point in one piece of context. The AGI request, that's asterisk gateway interface. What's cool about AGI is it divorces the application that you're writing 
from the asterisk server. Why is that slick? Well, it means you can scale out instead of scaling up. So where the old model was this behemoth PBX that did everything under the sun, the, uh, the monolithic PBX, you kept adding voicemail modules, you kept adding uh, conferencing, and we all heard the horror stories of the, the half a million dollar PBX or the hundred thousand dollar PBX. This is the exact opposite. Let's have the PBX do one thing and expose bindings to us that we can do cool shit with. Oops. Uh, it's cool stuff with, yeah. Um, and by doing that, that means a couple things. One, we can use the same PBX for multiple applications, of course. But two, it makes it ten times easier for those applications to scale because now we can use conventional load balancing techniques. Now, I mentioned run call flow. So speaking specifically of adhesion, this is what run call flow means. On the client side, where I've written this application, this Twitter vox, I run this command. Um, I've already created the voice app directory, which can be within a Rails app or can be outside of a Rails app. When I run this, it starts a daemon by default on port 4573, which is the AGI port, that asterisk gateway interface. What that does is runs the call, the call information, the metadata, in ASCII. So rather than sending across the wave or the PCM, which would again prohibit scaling quite as, as nicely, all that's going across between asterisk and adhesion is a pure text protocol. So you could run this on a DSL connection. You could run it on, um, with a little luck, maybe even on DreamHost on the, on the client side. I don't know what DreamHost would say about that, but <laughs> <laughs> when, when that connection arrives, so when we placed those phone calls, what showed up on that client application was a single TCP connection per phone call. And specifically, we've all, we're all used to HTTP breweries. What shows up here is an AGI URI, same structure. And actually, my business partner just uh, contributed this patch to Adhesion, which lets you hard code the application name and makes it easier to run multiple applications within the same uh, Adhesion runtime, which is pretty cool. So uh, this, this URL gets requested. If you've ever seen fast AGI, it looks really similar to fast AGI. Key value pairs show up, or HTTP for that matter. And then there is a file, appropriately named dialplan.rb, and dialplan.rb takes all the crap that conventionally would exist in extensions.conf, that's the asterisk extensions, and instead of having it sitting there where only the PBX admin can run it, we've moved it out to the client side where whoever's doing the application development can make all the changes they want. So you've got the full power of the asterisk dial plan, but you've got it on the client side in Ruby where it matters. And it runs stuff, hopefully uncommented, though. So um, if anybody's got a, a PC open, feel free to pull this up. Um, and I'll give you an URL later on that has all this stuff up on GitHub or GIST. Uh, what this is is the Phoenix Lander. So default, and I'm going to flip back here for a sec, this hoedown, which is an asterisk, is a context or a set of dial plan instructions, shows up. And like I said, you're running ho hoedown and you're running a block of stuff. In this case, we're running default with a block of stuff. And the stuff catches an exception if it happens, but otherwise will take a command or a, a, an URL argument, the A equals B. In this case, the URL argument is called Twitter user, and adhesion automatically exposes that to us in the local namespace. So all you need to do when creating this application is point to it, and you can, you can append state, if you will, from asterisk, and a whole bunch of it shows up automatically that we'll see here in a minute. And then it does more or less what you'd expect. Grab the JSON feed, decode it, um, get rid of cruft, and one caveat, if you're ever doing a demo, be careful with demoing the hot stuff. In a second, you'll see why. Uh, I, I tried to make the inverse. I tried to make it where uh, Twitter would call me when I tweeted, and I'll see that here in a sec. The problem is Twitter is uh, a little overloaded because we all know Rails can't scale. Uh, so the the twits show up a little slowly. Um, and then it runs Swift. Name of the voice, what to say, a couple pauses for grammar, the text that we just built, and then a friendly goodbye. So some, a couple text-to-speech engines. Um, this is all on the asterisk side. So the good news is 
if you uh, use Asterisk now or you install it yourself, some of it you don't have to worry about. The problem is a lot of it you do. When you download Asterisk now, you get a pretty bare bones configuration. So there is some effort required to get kind of the, the underpinnings going. Um, I covered speed, or actually I didn't cover. This, this will pace it and makes a lot of difference. Um, it really is the difference between her being all happy and her being like, man, what the hell are you saying to me, Twitter? Garbage in, garbage out. So I mentioned my inspiration for this was humans should not pull. I actually gave that number for the Twitter feed back or out to a couple people, and we got more calls than I expected. I was just playing around, and people started calling it, and they'd tell their friends, and it kind of got, it got viral among friends. Um, the problem is people actually kept calling it, and they'd call in like once a day, which is kind of cool. You know, people are using the application, but it's kind of stupid too because it's a square peg in a round hole. It's the wrong solution to the problem. Rather than having them call in to get the current tweet, Let's change it to have, the, have uh, the script call out to whoever you want to whenever a new tweet is posted or tweet is posted. It is tweet, isn't it? Tweet. I got to get my grammar right, you know? Oh. Exactly. If I'm in Huntsville, is it still tweet? Yeah. Tweet y'all. Tweet y'all. So with the tweet y'all. So here's the polling. Um, this is fairly straightforward if you've used continuations. And actually, my business partner, Eric, gets credit for, for writing this. Um, what we've got, go through, fairly basic, grab the current tweet ID, and then execute the, the, uh, the continuation. And lo and behold, we're actually able to use the same code that we used for this. And I'm going to go back a couple. We're using the same code that we used here for an outgoing call. What's this mean? I was able to call in, hear the Twitter. Now we've got this separate polar that's looking for information and is placing an outgoing call when it finds it. Well, rather than having to hard code what should happen when that call goes out, instead of hard coding it and, and having two separate, basically, forks of the code, or having to set up our own library just to do this, what we end up with is that functionality for free. The way we get that for free is this. When you place an outgoing call, you tell adhesion what should happen when the other end picks up that line. In this case, we tell it to do exactly the same thing as <coughs> happens when somebody calls into the phone number. So we've got the direct route if you call in, and then we've got this kind of shoehorned send this outgoing notification, and once somebody picks it up, send them back into that same AGI URL that we used before. So this AGI URL is just the same URL that we used before um, on, on our server. The other thing I want to note here, it's using DRB for all the outgoing communication. So something that, that comes free with adhesion is the ability to use not just AGI, that's the incoming request, so asterisk to the client. There's a separate protocol called AMI, asterisk manager interface. And that's from the client out to asterisk, so like for outgoing calls. And this is how we use it. Um, you'll also note, yes, that we pass in the local URI. All this is running on localhost here. Um, nothing funky on the outside. Oh, and sync and asynchronous. So I don't have an example here, but it's pretty straightforward to either block or don't block, depending on what you want for the user behavior. There's cases where, you know, if somebody's hitting a web page, you obviously don't want to block. Get it out of the, the inline path and go to town. But if you're running it as a rake task or you've got some, you need an absolute return code, by all means. Um, where, where it gets a little funky is when you're calling out, as, as Courtney might say, <coughs> fail. Somebody's not going to pick up or they're going to have a, a, a busy signal or maybe they're going to pick up, but it's not going to be human, it's going to be voicemail. Um, there's a whole bunch of corner cases that you have to consider if you really care about the user experience. But for our purposes, for just kicking some rear and building cool stuff, doesn't matter in the slightest. You know, just go to town. Ah, uh, yes, the process of building voice apps. So I learned this the hard way. Um, I try to be pretty TDD, but, well, 
it got to be really easy to just pull out the phone. Oh, I got another test here. I just implemented a couple lines. Let me call it and see, does it work or not? Well, imagine testing the Xbox without having an emulator. You would poke your eyes out. And I rapidly approached the point, even with teeny, teeny little apps, where I'd be like, all right, I'm going to call in again. I'm going to call in again and test it. So if you have to call in, you're doing something wrong. You'd look like this guy who's, I'm not sure what he's playing with, but it looks nuclear. And his hat says, I love you, for some reason. <laughs> this is what Google Images turns up, you know? You never can tell. So the way I've had the best luck, start out on paper, mock up exactly what you do, and it can literally be a little flow diagram. In fact, that's the most fun. Small first. So uh, do the, the very, very core functionality. No logging, no errors, no nothing. And then placeholders first. So when you call into a professional text-to-speech system or a professional IVR, usually what you're hearing is a WAV file or an MP3 or something. It's a pre-recorded uh, audio file. Don't do that. Don't bother. Use text-to-speech for everything, and until you get the exact workflow right, keep it as low-hanging as you can. So back to the incoming calls. When we called into Twitter, this is all the things that Asterisk passed in to the AGI library. Now... It gets even slicker because Adhesion does the heavy lifting of turning these into variables for you. So it lops off the AGI underscore, and all of these become first-class named variables. So for example, why is this slick? You get the caller ID. Why is this even slicker? Uh, if you enable it and your carrier doesn't, uh, doesn't disable it, you get the name or some permutation, which granted, the carrier has to choose to pass, both your SIP carrier and the cell phone or the, the PSTN carrier. but can actually be pretty slick. Like, when I call in to this number, it shows up as Davis Troy. Granted, reversed, but at least you kind of know who called in. Um, and you get the extension. You know exactly what they called and how they showed up. So, one more. This is a little more real and also falls into that category of, of viral stuff. This is called Yelp Vox. I kept running into really, really craptastic food. Fast food, uh, and this happened again in Huntsville. Uh, Mark actually introduced me into to a, a really good Mexican place, so thank you for undoing the damage of Thursday. <laughs> what Yelpvox does is assumes that you have the least common denominator cell phone. All you have is voice support. You don't have a web browser. You don't have SMS. Um, although, as it turns out, I'd argue it's actually better than using either of those two, and we'll see why here in a second. The, uh, the assumption that you only have phone calls, you only have voice, lets you use the phone number of the restaurant that you're closest to as sort of a proxy for how to geolocate where you are. So we have no GPS, and we can't ask you to enter the street address because you'd poke your eyes out. So we implement a little creativity, and we ask you for the phone number of the restaurant you're near. And lo and behold, oh, yeah, that's the other thing. Um, why would you use this with the iPhone now? Well, I didn't want to buy the iPhone until the 3G came out, so I had to build this for myself. As it turns out, phones really are the least common denominator, and just like people still use Google 411, even with the SMS and the web and Safari on my iPhone, I still call into Google 411 because it's the fastest way to get a, a phone number lookup, and that's still true here. It's the fastest way if you're standing in a mall or you're standing in a strip mall or whatever and they've got the phone number on, on the door, you're 30 seconds away from knowing what's near you, and you don't have to dink around with the browser and figure out are you in 3G or Edge or whatever. Um, and that you can extrapolate from that. Granted, that's, that's a corner case, but it's definitely true that a voice phone call is the one thing that your grandma understands about a cell phone. I hope. So this is Yelp Vox. I'm not very creative with the names, I know. If anyone has suggestions, I'm all ears. Smarticus. Smarticus. Please enter the number you wish to call. Okay. This voice is not very hot, I would think. 25905. Uh Uh-oh. Your call cannot be completed due to network error. Brutal. So... We've got two choices here. We could fork the presentation. Namely, I would go launch a terminal and run that AHN 
uh, start command that I forgot to this morning. Um, <laughs> that would be the one fork. The other fork is we're going to assume that the code does a better example. And these slides will be up, and the phone numbers will, will still continue to be there. So I hope this is, is kind of a blueprint and one that you can share with anybody else as, uh, as a way to call in. Uh, I mentioned this is all up on, on GIST or GitHub. This is the URL here. Feel free to pull it up. It's got the, uh, the full version. What we're doing is, oh, a little context here too. So before we had the, the little dialplan.rb file, right, that had the context, like default or hoedown, and then it had the block of code to run when a call showed up in that context. In this case, we've actually taken that code, moved it into what's called the, an adhesion component, which basically amounts to a helper, and that helper looks like this. Plain old class. We actually end up getting the call object, which has all the, all the goodies attached to it, showing up as call. And then we throw in a couple, uh, couple of accessors. Gets initialized just like you'd expect. And then down here, we go through it. You can pretty much read this, and, and it's self-explanatory. Let's pop into a couple of the methods that are doing the magic. You can see we get the restaurant, just see in a sec, get the phone number, describe where you are right now, and then see what else is nearby that might not suck as bad as wherever you're standing. Which brings up a pretty good point, or at least one that you'll run into really quickly. There's a right way and a wrong way to address somebody when you're talking to them over the phone. And that extends to computers, too. It's a, a little strange. It's almost like building your first website in that you realize all the things that, that characterize a professional quality or even a, just a, an enjoyable to use voice service like 1-800-GOOG-411 or 1-800-FREW-CALL, there's really a lot of teeny, teeny decisions. Latency matters. Is there a two second pause or is there a five second pause? What do you do if you have to go out and get data off some other web service and it takes some time? How do you deal with telling the user that? Um, how do you prevent her? Mark, is that Allison? No, I don't think that's Sad. <laughs> Allison's the text-to-speech voice. She looks like she could be Allison. Actually, um, Allison's the real voice of Asterisk. Oh, yeah. True. She's done the text-to-speech as well. Okay. So how do you ask them for something? And if you're collecting digits, like for Yelp Vox, we have to collect a phone number. Goal is to minimize the amount of data entry, minimize the confusion, and get them over that as quickly as you can. Because once they've entered data, they're yours. And by that, I mean they're going to complete the call. So if you can get it to the point where uh, maybe they press 1 to do something and that's all you need, or uh, as in this case, if you're getting caller ID anyway, why wouldn't you just default to the area code that you're in, that the person's calling from? So lo and behold, we get restaurant by phone, and so we have them ask, hello, stranger, or if you pass in a name, throw it out there, uh, and then please enter a restaurant's 10-digit phone number. And I didn't extend this to do, to do eight digit or seven digit, but you get the idea. We've got a string, it has the phone number, voila. And then we use the Yelp API to pull this back. Now, the overarching point here is it took, what, uh, 10 lines here and 12 lines here to pull off a service that you could actually share with people and that if you told Yelp about, they'd probably put it up and you might get 1,000 calls or 5,000 calls or whatever just of people tinkering with it. And then from there you can decide, hey, do I want to flesh it out? Um, maybe I want to let people record comments about what, uh, what they had as an experience. Maybe I want to let people press 2 to hear other people's comments spoken to them from the Yelp website. Yelp is like city search, but it doesn't suck. Um, if, if you get the, over the hump of having an application that you can extend and having those first few users you'll have the motivation to do the rest. At least I have so far. When are phones good? When are phones really, really awful? They are awesome when you need an immediate response. Uh, so immediate as in it calls me rather than I call it. They are awesome when you need a fast response. Fast as in low latency. Hey, what the heck? People can ignore SMS and people can certainly ignore client push like a web. The, really, the two big ones, for me at least, Phone is two-way, and yes, SMS is two-way, but the first time you ask someone other than you, and even, even for an internal application, the first time you ask an employee to sit there and type a little code as a response to an SMS, not going to happen. 
On the other hand, if you read them a little thing and say press 2 for this and press 3 for this, done. You're not going to have a, a four-way four round-trip conversation with SMS. And the other reason is everybody's got one. So if you're designing for something that's either publicly consumable or even, even a group of 20 people, other than this room, you're unlikely to find 20 people who all have uh, high-end smartphones. And last but not least, we have lemmings. I don't know about you, I like lemmings. Lemmings are easy to predict. So we've got them here, and I'm thinking, okay, why not do American Idol for Huntsville? So this is the Ruby Hoedown Idol. Now, I didn't populate it all the way. I didn't really want to uh, get ranked at the very bottom of the speakers, so you're not going to get to vote for real people here, um, <laughs> which is good. I, I'm, I'm protecting my own reputation, you know. So what we've got is, and this is, this is a mashup with Rails, if you will, except there's no real mashup to do. It's more or less automatic. And we've actually got uh, configuration instructions up on cloudvox.com if you want to see how to glue Rails and Adhesion. It's step-by-step. Step, takes about five steps. Um, took a whole bunch of effort on our part to get it down to five steps. But now that it's there, that's what it is. So do a couple validations. Um, and this, this actually spawned out of my best friend's girlfriend asking whether it's possible to stuff the ballots for American Idol. So indeed, it's not. Um, <laughs> I speak empirically. Uh, what, what we can do here, though, is replicate that same thing. So we have a vote model. We do basic validations, including seeing whether the caller ID can do stuff. Now, what I'd ask you to do is imagine for a second that in your applications, in less than 10 lines, you can control phone conferences. You could uh, kick off a recording and get back the URL to an MP3. You could let somebody call in and get bridged to an MP3 and press 2 to uh, pause it. You could collect as many digits as you want and not just play it back to them, but post it to a real web interface. Consider these as building blocks and start thinking about... No, why couldn't you stuff the ballot? I mean, you got enough DIDs, you could just uh, call from all of those different caller IDs and... You can set your caller ID or whatever you want to have to do. This is true, and it is doable with, with that caveat. Yeah, and actually, there's, I don't want to get too far into it, but there's two caller IDs. There's the one that you set, and there's the one that the carrier passes down to you if you have a PRI, a high-end, uh, or at least a, a slightly higher-end circuit. Exactly, and in theory, you wouldn't be able to spoof that, although it can be done too. So actually, if anybody wants to organize a, an American Idol rebel, you know, we could probably pull that off. So what's that do? Oh, and obviously the tiny URL if you want to pull that up. Um, this is also up on GitHub. So here's how we cast a vote. This is the dialplan.rb. Lo and behold, <laughs> grab the count, pick our voice, create the name of the text string, and then tell somebody this is how many times you've called cast the vote, and then, hey, here's your result. Now, clearly not the most sophisticated thing, but that's the point. Ruby is not the sophistication here. This is, this is Ruby that we all know. This is the same functionality that we all know. Um, if anything, it's on the very, very light end of the difficulty spectrum. Somebody with pretty basic Ruby experience could pull, pull this off, and they'd have a pretty neat thing going. They could extend it in any direction they want. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, the, uh, the underlying realization here is this isn't a technical problem. There's a couple other libraries that I'll, I'll cover here. Um, I actually just contributed some code to Telegraph. The difference is where with Adhesion, all the stuff that we've seen is pretty much standalone. So it's got this dialplan.rb that lives in its own world, has access to the Rails models or active uh, record models, can do whatever it wants, sure, but is pure phone code and geared only for phone code. In contrast, Telegraph mixes the two, and the way it does that is, if you've seen the uh, respond to, you know, wants.html, wants.xml, the different MIME type based responses, this act actually adds a placeholder MIME type for voice. 
which sounds really cool. It sounds like an awesome abstraction. The farther I got into it, the less it is because the things people want to do in phone calls are very different than the things people want to do over the web. So even though you can have a separate view that is your phone view that decides how to speak the data that does whatever you want that's specific to the phone, it turns out that the controllers are different enough that it's really more effort than it's worth. And then the last one, and this is actually worth mentioning, it might be the easiest way to get started, although telegraphs come along, or adhesions come a long way, is Raggy. And this goes back a couple years. This is the original Ruby voice API. Um, this is mixed, so it's, dare I say it, a, a little closer to PHP than anything. It isn't what I would stick with, but does let you just as a one-liner or a two-liner <coughs> do some stuff. So back to the examples, back to the cool, building cool stuff and not being too worried about anything except solving my own problem. I went looking for houses, and if you've ever been, been to Seattle, that's a really sorry experience. Um, even before, well, certainly before the bubble, and even now, it's, it's a painful experience. So I'd wander around, and I'd see a house, or I'd see a condo, and I'd see a flyer box, but it wouldn't look like this flyer box. Instead, it would be empty, always. Like half the freaking flyer boxes, all, all I ask a real estate agent, or all I would ask if I was selling a house, is to keep this flyer box stocked. So if somebody walks by, they're going to get a flyer. They don't do that for whatever reason. Uh, they're getting their 6% or what have you, and they're empty. So my rant aside, I set out to solve this problem because, again, I was carrying around a device that is totally capable of solving this problem for me. So I built SendSign. And what SendSign is, is you can call in or SMS in or email in from your smartphone a house number or a multiple listing uh, for sale property number and get back the bedrooms, the bathrooms, does it have hardwood, does it have a deck, what have you, what's the price, when was it built, blah, 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 uh, all that good stuff. And if you're an agent, you can upload that information or it'll pull, off, pull it off the MLS directly. Why is that cool? It's really cool because now I control my own destiny. And if I turn this on to the public and told them where they could control their own destiny, I'd be able to, I think, get a pretty quick viral adoption. It doesn't take too much, you know. Granted, there's 2 million iPhones out there. There's probably another 2 million Blackberries. But that means there's 200 million plain old phones in the U.S. that people are carrying around in their pockets. And you've got to figure other people have encountered that same problem that I have. And they don't need a sign. You know, there doesn't need to be anything special. You can tell them sideband. So... This is slick because it means somebody with Ruby experience could build what amounts to a standalone business. Um, I fleshed this out pretty far to the point that it effectively is now, and we'll give it a shot. Please enter the number you wish to call. Oh, damn, I went 0 for 2. Let me try that one more time. This is what I get for having half production uh, applications. I keep putting myself into this. You know, I'm going to demo everything, even if it kills me. And it is. <laughs> Let's see what we've got. I think it's just a call fail, right? That may be, yeah. Uh... Let's save them on for a second. Apparently, the hardest part of this is learning to work my cell phone. Please enter the number you wish to call. One more here. And this latency is some processing I'm doing. Please enter the house number or the MLS number of any home for sale. 
that takes the spin. That is not, and actually, that's a prime example of what it can sound like in production. That's why I tell people, don't worry about what it sounds like with text-to-speech, because you're not going to... Brooklyn Avenue, 21 in Seattle, features two bedrooms and one bathroom. 938 square feet. Offered for $299,950. It was built in 1929 and features laundry room, hardwood, balcony, natural gas. Visit www.sensign.com to learn more about the homes you visited. Don't forget to add this phone number to your phone's address book. Thank you for calling. So why did I bother with that? I wanted to show the relatively small amount of effort that created, other than <laughs> being 50% reliable, this, uh, this actually live application. That data wasn't static. That was actually pulled off the MLS, um, fed through, and lo and behold, I'm going to detour for a second, and you're going to be stunned to see I'm running Windows. It is lame. I've gone through three laptops in three weeks, and I haven't had a chance to re reinstall Ubuntu, let alone Gen 2. So... If I can actually get a browser, which is easier said than done in this hellish OS. There we go. So why do I demo that? Here is why I demoed that. What we've created, and granted, Adhesion and Ruby is only a little part of this. You know, there's an SMS functionality. There's email functionality. Is an offline mode for Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> We're really good at creating that offline mode. I don't know. I don't even have to write any code to create that. Forgive this quick detour. I think it will be worthwhile. By the way, if I can put in a plug, Sprint Internet Cards Anywhere, I was, really, uh, I was unwilling to pay the money for it. It's worth every dime. This is the, uh, the Sprint Evdo magic. So what we're going to do is get ourselves some interweb with the Sprint Smart View. Could you come up with a better marketing name, guys? Come on. Somehow they managed to take the Nextel logo. The Wi-Fi works, too. Does it? OK. Thanks for running. I was having... Okay, the the Wi-Fi is running on two Sprint cards. <laughs> <laughs> so, another fan. See, there we go. <laughs> so, I am now connected, which means... Oh, by the way, this was built in Google Docs, so I'm not totally a Windows kid. What we're going to do is load sendsign.com and, lo and behold... The number that I just called in with from my cell phone, imagine for a second that I'm a house shopper, or I'm just Joe off the street who walked by a house that was for sale, and it piqued my interest, and the flyer box was empty, or even if it wasn't empty, normally I'd just pick one up and I'd throw it in the back of my car, because who shops for houses or condos by grabbing a flyer box and then reading them when you get home? That's just not how you do it. Rather than doing that, what if I could show up and then at home wait for the page to load and load and <laughs> come on see more proof that Rails doesn't scale there we go and voila so I'm going to log out just to uh, show the experience here let's say I, I show up at sendtime.com I'm Joe off the street and this is unifying phone, web, and anything else you want to add to it. How did I inquire? Well, I called in, and my number is 206-683-8769. And by saying this on video, I'm guaranteeing I'm going to get all kinds of stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> Please don't spoof me. And four minutes ago, I called in here, and lo and behold, we're pulling the same data off the web, and we're able to unify that experience. So we've now used the phone as the way to connect people to bring them back to the web. We've solved that original problem we set out to. Um, everybody is happy. I'm happy as a buyer because I'm not lost and I can answer my question right then. I'm happy when I get home because I get to get real information about it. And as a real estate agent, I actually get to communicate with people without, you know, not 
not being not uh, getting their email address or their privacy invading information, but I get to put something up here that connects the dots. As a buyer, I want this information. So then as an agent, if I have a, a listing that is, uh, is active, I can see, and this is one, this is a different listing, but I can see nothing about privacy. Like we make sure to, uh, to do this. And this isn't commercial. It's just a concept. I wanted to, to prove the, the concept. Um, we see who called in, but not specific, just how and when and, and where. And you know, I've got basic updates and all this. The slick part of this is it's essentially a business. You could go around to real estate agents, and for all I know, we may, and say, hey, we've solved this problem for you. And it's all Ruby. It's mostly adhesion. Um, and it's all phone-based. This is the type of stuff that, if you want a side project, is totally buildable. So back to this. Here's what it looks like on the back side. This was actually build, built with Telegraph instead of adhesion. Um, and introduces a couple concepts that only come up because of the phone world. In the phone world, you don't have a Google Analytics. You don't have really any kind of real reporting. You've got to handle it all yourself. Somewhat annoying, but things, different things matter, you know? If, if somebody hangs up, I did something wrong. If somebody goes all the way through and has to spend three or four minutes on the phone, I did something wrong. So you're measuring for different things and caring about different things. Um, and we also have to track, assuming you want to support multiple protocols, the, the request method, a little bit of the logging. And then this is what I was alluding to about how Telegraph overloads the MIME type and creates a, a virtual voice MIME type, if you will. And so just like you render, render a template with the HTML version, you render a voice template. And that voice template, or partial, looks like this. We're going to play something. This is a, this is a view. And it actually lives in, in your views directory as blah.voice. Uh, play something you know, using variables set by the controller. And then this is where it gets a little hairy. We actually have a voice form that posts to a controller but looks the same as, say, form tag would or uh, any other type of form. So we're telling it what to collect, what to play first, um, what, what to store it in, all, all the things about the collection. And then when the user does that, when they press pound at the end, it actually shows up just like you would via via a regular HTTP post. Sadly, we're all stupid. I'm stupid. My users are stupid. The listing providers are stupid. <laughs> Everybody is stupid. <laughs> all I have to do is deal with their errors day in and day out. So users, uh, they'll drop off from time to time. Their expectations are a little different than yours. Uh, one neat thing, the second time they call in, they're thrilled. The first time, it seems like, is always the learning experience with any kind of phone or voice app. The minute they call back in, in fact, if you, if you build something to maturity, you may want to adjust the behavior for future calls because they have different expectations than that first one. Um, the listing providers are stupid. I mentioned Twitter is uh, not exactly the best for text-to-speech input. You have to parse out enough granularity so that you're not using text-to-speech for huge blobs here. I want to use text-to-speech for the number of bedrooms, or I want to use text-to-speech to say hardwoods or whatever. But as you mature this, and this gets back to my point about you don't need to worry about text-to-speech quality that much. You don't need to worry about speech recognition quality that much. Why? Because you won't use either of them very often. Um, Uh-oh. So... Stupid. <laughs> I, <laughs> stupid is calling. Um, Unknown. In fact, they probably are. So, <laughs> so, actually, I set up the uh, the Twitter watcher on Mars Phoenix this morning. So this may actually have been a, a Twitter alert. Discovered live. <laughs> exactly. Test. Stupid live. Stupid live. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is so darn stupid. So, wow, I'm popular today. We're gonna just uh, shut this off for a minute. So um, why are the listing providers stupid, and why should you not really care about text-to-speech or speech recognition? The reason you shouldn't care about either of those 
is because by the time it actually sees the light of day, and by the time you're sharing it with people who aren't your friends, the amount of stuff or the percentage of the words that you're going to use for text-to-speech or for speech recognition, infinitesimal. You might use it for numbers. Maybe you'll use it for a couple keywords. But as you saw here, where I was saying hardwoods or it has marble or whatever, it's just as easy, easy to record prompts. And even if you had the most awesome text-to-speech in the world, you would still spend the effort to record prompts. There aren't that many cases where you need truly free-form data, and not that many of them are good for phones. So don't worry about it. Build it, and the problems will go away. So logging. Again, there is no web trends or Google Analytics for phones, so you can do it yourself. I have a request model, which uh, I should have renamed this so I don't look like a total clown. Don't ever rename a model request. <laughs> uh, it belongs to things that make more sense from a naming perspective, although recipient, again, shoot me in the head. Before validation, we set the default timestamps because we care about a couple things, like say, when they're requesting it, and then we format it cleanly, and this 2S is just what the, uh, the view is actually inlining for the agent. So pretty clean formatting, um, nothing magic there, and then a result type that has many failures. This is probably the most interesting part of that, in that as soon as you have the slightest few users, even if they're internal, even if it's like uh, we're working with a, a company now that does uh, restaurant listings online, and they have an awesome iPhone app that rocks and has led to a whole bunch of people saying, hey, you have some uh, data you might want to correct. And they're doing that or considering doing that over the phone, which is a perfect use case. Call out to the, to the restaurant, say, hey, are you still open? Is this your current information? Press one. If it is, press two. If it's not, leave yourself a voicemail. Voila. They've eliminated days, if not weeks, worth of human calling. <clears throat> but when you do that, you really want a model like this to track what happens to make sure you're doing a good job of your experience. Ah, uh, yes. So getting this running, it's really magic. You DHCP. You, oh, wait, no, shit, reality. Um, <laughs> sorry. You set up a whole bunch of stuff, and then at the end, you're finally able to do that last 10% with adhesion. This covers some of it. Um, it gets a little bloodier from there. Like, there are three, count them, three different conferencing apps for asterisk. They all have different shades of gray. I wouldn't want to rely exclusively on any one of them. They matter for different things. And the right way to run into them is not by seeing a list of them. It's by saying, this is the thing I want. Tell me which one I should use, at least for me as a Ruby developer. Um, I don't want to have to learn a whole bunch about phones. I want to be able to write code that does cool stuff. Um, at the very top or bottom is the API, and it's living on all these things. They need to be configured properly. So where are we now? The past year, people are starting to get aware of Asterisk. Uh, Asterisk and Digium, which is a local company, is starting to become aware of the fact that the way to scale their business, or one of the ways to scale their business, is not just relying on people who are building PBXs. It's that all of us in this room will do, do cool stuff, and stuff that they'd never thought of and won't have time to execute on, if, and only if, the infrastructure is there to create it. So if we do the building blocks, and if the, it's that last 10% so we can all sit there and tinker, a whole bunch of cool stuff is going to happen. And between Digium realizing that um, and all of us hopefully realizing that, I think there's, there's the potential to see some real phone applications show up in the next year. FreeSwitch is evolving. Uh, it's a good platform. It's not quite there yet, but they're making progress. Uh, abstractions on abstractions. So there's adhesion, and as of yesterday, there's a new application called Open Diesel that uh, is IVR oriented um, and it's just another way to shorten and do more with less code. Um, things are really getting popular. The whole world now, including my grandma, knows about 1-800-GOOG-411 and it's really creepy to hear your grandma say, have you tried 1-800-GOOG-411? She shouldn't be mentioning 800 numbers. You'd have to know my grandma. Um, <laughs> or 1-88-DO-FRUCALL and I'll tell you the day she mentions that. Uh, developers, so the last thing that we need is developers. And we actually built a platform specifically for this at the very bottom here. Whoops, did I say that wrong? I don't want any developers at all. Not a one. None of you. All of you. Go. You're all stupid. Not so much. So the final thing we need is developers. Um, and I hope I've shown that you can build a whole bunch of cool stuff with minimal effort. 
um, myself and, and my cohort, because we kept running into this problem, ended up building what we call CloudVox, which takes that 90% and more or less builds it for you. And then you can code the last 10%. Um, so if you want a, uh, the chance to experiment or tinker, send me an email. We'll hook you up. Um, basically, we point AGI at you, so you install adhesion on your end, and voila, you're making phone calls. Um, that's almost unreadable, but it'll be up at cloudbox.com slash go slash hoedown with links to all the gists and the githubs, uh, as well as instructions that say specifically the five commands that you have to run to get to the point where you can actually do that same uh, Mars Phoenix application. I, I was just thinking, have you guys considered advertising on the actual stands that are empty that contain, you know... Oh, for the housing thing? Yeah, putting it something saying, you know, if this is empty, dial this number. You know, we're trying to figure out what to do with it. Like, th that was the original thing that spawned CloudVox, because we, I had this problem last summer and said, man, I, I would build something. And then in, in the process, we spent eight months building the infrastructure to get to the point where I could build the application pretty quickly. And now that we're there, we're trying to make it easier for other people to do the same thing. But yeah, if, if we run with it, that's a great idea. And Fred Couples, who is a golfer but apparently also knows the business world, said it really well. I'll let you read that, but uh, imagine for a second that whether it's Nagios or whether it's your own integration application or maybe it's something you work with that your salespeople might want to call in and check in or um, maybe you have a tracking site and you want to let people call in and record their blood glucose readings, 42, 87, whatever. Um, if it's simple, if it's fast, if it's explainable to a user in an average phone call, you can probably build it in less than an hour, maybe two hours of effort to get it to proof of concept. Uh-oh, I'm out of slides. Questions, comments, suggestions? So can you please summarize what all we need to get going? Um, to sure. So at the minimum, there's the, the underpinning, which will either be asterisk or free switch, and I'd recommend asterisk given the relative stages right now. That can either run in dedicated hardware, so you could download it or you know, install a, an RPM or Debian package or what have you. You can get a VM for it, so like asterisk now. Um, you can use CloudVox, which is the hosted version, but scales way down. That's the underpinnings. On top of that, you need stuff that you can run in that asterisk container, so text-to-speech. There's uh, one called Festival that's free. It's, yeah, it's good for what it is. Um, and then there's, <laughs> I'm, I'm being kind. And then there's Kepstrel, uh, which is what you heard there, which is just good in general but there is a licensing cost attached to it. That covers kind of the text-to-speech building block. If you move over one, there's conferencing, um, things like app underscore conference, app underscore conf call. Uh, there's a third one that's escaping me right now. Then moving over another bucket, you'll need to get a carrier, so either a SIP provider or, God forbid, do not ever buy a hardware device. Sorry, Mark. Uh, if you can avoid it. So... I am a huge fan of SIP. I am a huge fan of not having to own FXO, FXS, uh, PRIs. If you can avoid having to own a direct connection to the PSTN and do it through SIP, you will save yourself so much headache getting up and going and then figure out what to do in production. Um, so that's a, another part of the building block. If we keep moving over, um, then you'll need either some DIDs or phone numbers with which to people, people can call into your app. You know, my experience has been exactly the opposite, that uh, until we went away from SIP, we could not get our call quality the way it needed to be in our office, you know. And Interesting. We were using, I mean, you know, we just could not rely on the Internet as a reliable, um, you know, means of, of always making sure that our, and it, we were just getting dropped calls and uh, poor call quality and all sorts of issues. Brutal. With multiple carriers, or trying different carriers? Yeah, and we were on a fiber link, you know. I mean, it, I don't know. It's just, um, it seems like the phone, the PSTN has been around for 100 years longer, and it's a little, a little bit more reliable. Than, That's a great point. Than the internet, so. Yeah, if you have quality concerns, certainly. That's a really complicated <laughs> issue, though. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a couple of 
couple of us were in the building where we had 300 SIP phones, and you can't tell the difference between that and a regular PSD one. Yeah, when it's working well, it, you know, we just have, I don't know. Right. I think it's like the key distinction. If you've got good quality internet and or uh, reliable, well, you'll give it a shot, I guess, is the real answer. It's, it's low touch enough to, uh, to do that. Um, at least in our case, the real pain was having to go through all the building blocks. Like, it's easy enough to go and download the, the asterisk now VM, but it was all the other stuff and organized documentation and getting phone numbers and stuff that was a pain in the rear for us. I'm interested in your scaling architecture, how you're doing that. Well, on the asterisk level. On the asterisk level? Yeah. Uh, my original goal was to get to the point where we had 100,000 people with their own little teeny PBX slices, and I still hope to get to that point. We, we aren't obviously there yet, but we scaled it down so far that it's not like tied to a VM or a piece of hardware or anything. It is kind of the scale out of asterisk. So at the low end, it's a teeny, teeny slice of a system, but it's totally private. Nobody can record your calls. Um, you can associate SIP calls or SIP phones with it just like you regularly would. So it's an app-oriented PBX, but it's also um, a regular SIP connection. And then at the high end, we do some, some stuff to do, uh, I guess you'd say load balancing, but really boils down to making one phone number able to handle way more calls than any single asterisk install ever could. Like if, so, if, like if say, somebody wanted to do a killer app that did 10,000 concurrent calls, how would you handle that? Scale out, which is to say multiple little, little installations. It's probably worth having a, a conversation if you want. Good, good. Let's catch up. Um, can Adhesion work in conjunction with Trixbox or something like that, or will they compete for the, the, the dollar plan? It depends. So in Trixbox, you can point the uh, a, one of your extensions or a, a whole context to Adhesion, and if you do that, you'll be able to, to control the whole dial plan. So it really, I guess, depends what level you want to pass that on to. Say something on that real quick. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't waste your time with Trixbox. Don't do it. I, I wouldn't. I don't have a choice. We've already got it. Um, it's already. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Other questions, thoughts? That's the speed trick condition. Probably the the leader there is a company called Lumenbox, and I guess I'd say, for my gut, it's a B, maybe a B minus. But my standards are pretty high for speech recognition. Um, it gets way better if... Obviously I never had the call Delta. <laughs> <laughs> in, in that case, it's a D. What they have that can differentiate yes and no in an airport when you're an airline? So that's someone who's designed for the exact <laughs> use case. They're looking for one of two words, and they can't pull it off. Yeah. So I, normally I'd rather go for, for digit entry where you can. But if you can constrain it to a really small vo vocabulary, yes, no, and a half dozen other words, then it works just fine. But don't expect any kind of, of freeform text entry or you know, freeform speech. It really depends on your voice model, though, and how good they are, what it really depends on. For, for speed recognition? Yes. The voice model. Oh, your grammar. Yeah, it depends on your grammar. How good your grammar is. That's because Lumenbox uses faith which is the, you know, no. you can get pockets things. It's just a modified version of it that uses parts. But their voice models are so much better than everything else. Interesting. I haven't looked under the covers with Lumen Box. That's correct, isn't it, Mark? I don't know. I think it uses space. It has in their, copyright, in their copyright notice or whatever. It does? Yes. Yeah. That may just be news to me. A, a little stuff from, from CMU, too. The Lumenbox guys... A lot of that stuff is, you know, the, the CMU libraries have been used by a lot of people because they have a bunch of sort of underlying speech technologies that they develop. So maybe that there's something there. But maybe they use Sphinx, it's certainly used to be. Sphinx is really slow. Sphinx is painfully slow. Yeah, if, if you see CMU Sphinx as a speech recognition engine, don't bother. Sorry, voice recognition Oh, excellent. So these will be up at uh, cloudbox.com slash go slash hoedown. And by all means, if you have an AGI question or an adhesion question or you want to tinker and you need a place to do it, send me an email.
I'd love to see cool stuff come out of this. In fact, I hope if I show up next year that some of the crowd will have released some cool stuff or, or added the 5% to an existing application that is the phone functionality. Because we need to get this infrastructure to the point where you don't have to decide, I'm building a phone application or I'm building a voice application. Um, as a friend of mine, Thomas Howe says, voice or phones is the paprika. It makes everything taste better. So you shouldn't need to decide, I'm going to go spend the effort. It should just be, hey, I'm writing more Ruby. And just like I, you know, I don't have to decide whether I'm going to use active record. It just works. Thank you. <laughs>